OK, hello, everyone. I'm Melissa York, the assistant property editor of The Times and The Sunday Times. Um, and welcome to the last event of the conference, which, as you know, today it's all been about placemaking. Uh, and I have the pleasure of being joined by David McHale today, whose architecture practice, uh, McHale Riches with Cathy Hawley, won last year's Reba Sterling Prize for Architecture for one of my favourite examples of placemaking in the UK, Goldsmith Street, in one of my favourite places in the UK, Norwich. Um, it's a social housing project that's produced to passive house standards. So it's very energy efficient. Um, which should result in much lower energy costs for its residents. And it's also beautiful with a streetscape that encourages connectedness and play. So uh, Reba President Alan Jones called it a beacon of hope. So we will be taking some of your questions from 2.45. Uh, but for now, I think we have a very short video, only about three minutes. So you can see what David and his team created. I mean, it's, you know, something that's been happening over 100. Sorry. <laughs> Let's start again. There's a long history of council housing. I mean, it's, you know, something that's been happening over 100 years. It's great to see that they're able to do it again, because actually, if you look back at some of the most forward thinking and innovative housing solutions, they have come from councils. We've seen that the private sector can't deliver sufficient homes that are affordable for people. I think it's great to see more councils developing. One of the things that um, we were really concerned about was providing safe places for children to play in the scheme. So there's a number of different areas of landscaping. There are what we call ginnels, which are kind of glorified alleyways at the back of people's gardens where small children can play safely. They're actually kind of not publicly accessible, uh, but they open up onto spaces like this. It was really important that children could access play spaces from their houses without crossing roads. It's very rare that a council raises the bar and says, can you do passive house? Normally your, your um, aspirations get diluted, but they did, they did ask us, could we do a passive house scheme? Um, and that came from them. The roofs are made of black glossy pantiles, which are a material you see in Norwich a lot because it's quite closely linked with Holland. There's a lot of the Dutch materials that ended up here. So a lot of the buildings you see around have pantiles. I think it's really wonderful to come here when the kids are back from school and see them all playing in the alleyways is what we hoped, but we, you know, were slightly maybe nervous about how they'd work, but actually the, what people tell us is it's been a kind of mechanism for them meeting neighbours, for their kids getting to know each other and making friends. So it's, yeah, that's brilliant. It's great to see people living here. Great. Um, yes. So, David, if you could just tell us a little bit about what the brief was from Norwich City Council, um, a little bit about consultation that went on and kind of what the contract was that you were under. That would be really helpful. Oh, sorry. I think there's something going on in the background, which we don't want. Um, yeah. Hi, Mister. Thank you. Um, technical glitch over. Um, the brief was really great. So... Uh, it was very aspirational. It talked from the outset about making a place that was walkable, 
The site is 10 minutes away from the city centre. It talks about connecting, making connection, meaningful connections with the local community, both, you know, both in terms of fitting in, but also uh, physical, new physical connections and permeability across what was a kind of post-war site with kind of cul-de-sacs and dead ends previously. Um, it talked initially about, you know, a sustainable approach without putting too much emphasis on what that was. Um, and it held an RIBA, international RIBA competition. Um, so they set their stall out for quality by spending a bit of money on a competitive process with the RIBA. Mm -hmm. We were lucky enough to win that back in 2009. Um, and um, the project famously died a death during the last big crash and came back with Norwich City saying, well, not only are we the clients rather than, rather than using developer partners, mm -hmm. but we want it to be 100% social housing, not a mix. And we also would like you to look at Passive House. So the brief was great. Um, and the process by which they chose the right scheme for the site was very unusual. It's very unusual to have architectural yeah. competitions for housing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It really is. And, you know, particularly for, for social housing as well. Um, and as you said, it's a hundred percent social housing. And I think that, um, it, really says something when a project like this wins the Reba Sterling Prize and is called a beacon for hope, you know. I mean, what kind of message do you think that that sends, particularly as we've been talking a lot about about beauty in placemaking, um, you know, that, that affordable homes, it's not just that they can be beautiful, it's that they should be beautiful. Yeah, do you I think, think that's, yeah, that's what they were trying to say with the prize. I, I think every project we do, no matter what the price point, we're going to try and make it beautiful. Mm. And that's beauty in terms of the way it looks and feels. That's beauty in terms of what it's like to get close to and touch and live in and bang into and be a parent in or be an older person in. There are so many scales and levels of beauty, um, which we like to try and consider. Um, there's the connectedness. There's the beauty of living in a community which develops naturally because everything's been laid out with a view to making those things happen. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's, I think what's really beautiful about the scheme is, for example, the Ginnels, which have been so successful, um, yeah. which is about promoting small children. It, was, it comes from a childhood memory of mine of playing in the back alley with my friends at the end of the garden. That was where we all wanted to be. That was where all the great stuff happened. Mm -hmm. as children. We wanted to replicate that here. Um, so there's, there's all there's all kinds of beauty, and I know the beauty of the beauty commission is focused mainly on the visual realm, which of course is important, and I, I welcome that whole conversation. Um, but I think there are so many levels to a great place. I know the beauty commission also talks about very good things that are embedded here, like you know, walkable neighbourhoods, promoting cycling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, yeah, there are too many issues to talk about without maybe looking at the actual project. Yeah, exactly. It's what I was thinking. So, I mean, um, just to kind of prep everyone, I suppose um, this could be seen as part of a, an architectural trilogy. And, uh, and you started off kind of in Suffolk um, with Clayton, which is a really interesting kind of barn inspired project. And then moved on to this project, the Goldsmith Street, uh, Street project in Norwich and now you're currently working uh, in the city of York as well so yes yeah, so if we could get those slides up and we could just have a quick look at um, perhaps as we go along and we have a look at them you could explain um, what you think really worked for each of those projects kind of what lessons you learned which what you wanted to carry over from one project to another yeah can you see my screen yeah yeah I can see it yep yeah so um, I'm I'm nicking Annalise's presentation for the RIBA Sterling um, jury. But um, so we, we often talk about Goldsmith Street as being the kind of grown up version of our earlier project, which, again, we won in our RIBA competition back in 2005 um, in a village called um, Elmswell uh, in Suffolk. And that, again, a great brief um, 
And I think great briefs are important because they they're, they're the reason that they're the thing that generate these these projects, you know. So in this case, we were looking at a client that wanted to celebrate rural architecture mm-hmm. as being relevant in the 20th century, late 20th century, as it was then. Um, that could be sustainable both in terms of carbon, but also again similar ideas about pedestrians and cycles on the edge of village. So it was looking for a scheme that um, could harness some ideas about sustainability and and a kind of localism, a kind of local vernacular. So we we investigated. This is a sectional drawing taken through two of the terraces, which um, shows one of the principles of a solar orientated master plan in other words every house is uh, designed around maximum possible use of winter sunshine as a way of warming up properties and keeping fuel bills low mm-hmm. and across the site we we organized again this is relatively high density for edge of village um, we organized homes into groups of three in kind of a barn typology which of course is a nod to the kind of rural context. Um, and unusually for, compared to I think the other um, uh, competition entrants, we managed to do predominantly houses rather than flats, even though it's quite high density. And we did that by very carefully organizing the, the barns around the site um, in such a way that in some places they were they're quite intimate you know the back gardens are quite close to each other but that allowed us to have um, really significant shared space such as a small children's play area in a apple orchard in the middle um, uh, an allotment uh, garden and also a wildflower garden so um, so this is what it looked like um, so quite rural edge of village local materials are um, um, lime renders with local Suffolk lime colours mm-hmm. and timber frame sprayed with hempcrete so very innovative and very low carbon um, mm-hmm. so we learned quite a lot from that scheme because we were lucky enough to have a post occupancy analysis done by our engineers who used a PhD student mm-hmm. and you know some of the findings were slightly uncomfortable um, so some of the in- innovations like the district heating and the shared rainwater recycling hadn't worked as well as anticipated Mm -hmm. honest with you Um, but some things have worked really well and what worked really well was the solar orientation and the fuel bills were incredibly low much Mm -hmm. better than expected so when when it came to looking at the competition for goldsmith street which was pretty much the same time as we got the poe from um, Clayfield post occupancy and um, POA the post occupancy analysis. We were very keen to bring some of those lessons and that learning to to Norwich. And so, ten minutes away from the city centre, um, we were very interested in doing, if we could, a much higher density version of a solar scheme, which mm-hmm. is quite challenging. Um, and, you know, it took us a long time to get to what we thought was the right solution. Um, and, and the kind of eureka moment was that actually to get the kind of density that the client wanted, which was about 94 homes per hectare, per hectare, which is quite dense, that we should really look at parts of Norwich that had already achieved that. And just over the road is an area called the Golden Triangle, which is much loved um, part of Norwich. And, on analysis, it, 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 you know, it has 14 metre wide separation between both the fronts of buildings, but also the backs. And this is an aerial of part of that golden triangle with Portland Street and Dover Street. Um, and so when we came to master planning the site, um, we started looking at kind of questioning the, the assumptions of a 22 metre overlooking distance, which is embedded in most planning guides and most local authority um, planning strictures. And And, and why is that? Do you know why that is? Well, um, (laughs) it's all to do with a nipple, apparently. (laughs) Um, 
Um, yeah, so we, we wondered long and hard about why, and, and recently annalee has been getting some uh, feedback from some planning friends of hers that it's all to do with the um, Parker and Unwin, who in the turn of the 20, 20th century decided that there needed to be some kind of stipulation about a woman's modesty and um, they went into a field and, and looked at each other with their shirts on and decided that at 70 feet they would not be able to see each other's nipples and um, this is rumoured to be the case we don't have it as but still I mean a, an amazing kind of piece of uh, Edwardian logic that somehow still prevails today <laughs> prevails not only in Britain but <laughs> Across the Anglo-Saxon world, you know, so America, Australia, New Zealand, they all have the 22 metre, 70 foot rule for mm -hmm. overlooking. And it's all about an Edwardian notion of propriety. So, so you want to shake that up with the streetscape um, and that would allow you by narrowing the streets, it would allow you to um, build houses rather than flats. So why was it so important for you to have houses rather than flats? Why were you so insistent on that? OK, so. It's a combination of things. Um, I think most, I mean, the brief call for family orientated housing. Um, and I think families tend to want to have a ground floor and access to a garden and ac easy access for children to play. Um, not everyone, but it's a generalization. And secondly, we were looking at a solar scheme. So that precludes tall buildings anyway. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted to set ourselves the task, if you like, of seeing if we could draw up a master plan that was solar, that had houses rather than flats wherever possible, mm -hmm. um, and that stayed low, you know, two to three storeys. And um, we eventually found a way of doing it. Um, it took a while. I think we had to throw a quite well-developed scheme into the bin at one stage. Um, so that we're talking about east-west streets um, with terraces um, fronting south, um, obviously with a north facade as well. Um, very simple in a way. It looks very simple, doesn't it? Just a series of two streets, east-west. But actually, when you take a section through it, this is what we're talking about. So each street is 14 metres wide, and each garden back-to-back -back is 14 metres wide with a central play space ginnel that you saw in the video. Um, the roofs the roofs are all calibrated very finely to optimise winter sunshine into neighbouring properties, which is an idea that's come from Clayfield. Yeah, I was about to say, it's got the same. So that's so they don't shade each other, the houses. Yeah, exactly that. And um, when, we, when we go a bit further and look at, this is a kind of passive house diagram. Um, I won't dwell on this, but... Um, when we look at the plans of a house, um, this is a typical two-bedroom house entered from the south. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, Melissa. Uh, yes, yes, just about. It's quite small. Yeah, OK. So you're entering off a relatively generous south-facing front garden, which is big enough for a table and chairs. Um, which hides bins, which hides gas and electricity meters and all that kind of paraphernalia that you usually associate with, you know, housing now, um, which hides all that stuff. It makes a meaningful private garden space facing south. And people are actually both sitting here with a cup of tea or a glass of wine and they're occasionally putting their washing out here. So the street is very animated with people doing their thing, which I really enjoy. Um, and you walk like a lot of our favourite houses in the UK, terraced housing, you walk straight into a significant room. In this case, it's a big kitchen dining room. So these houses are really wide. They're six metres wide. Um, and so four of the three of sorry, three of the four habitable rooms facing south. So if you come up the stairs, you've got both bedrooms, a twin and a double facing oh. south over the street. Um, at the back of the staircase, there's a big hallway, which is big enough for homeworking or even a, um, a sofa bed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like a lot of our favourite housing around the UK, we're pairing front entrances to kind of encourage kind of neighbourliness. Um, mm -hmm. And there you see a north-entered house 
next to a north entered house so the north side of the street is really diddy so that mm -hmm. very low because it's all about sh you know avoiding overshadowing so that's just over four and a half meters to that gutter but i think what's nice about this image is you get a sense of the quality of the materials we were able to use so yeah. that you know that's a really high quality uh rain water you know gutter high quality clay pan tile mm -hmm. Um, three millimeter thick, really robust, expanded aluminium purpose made doors onto the gas and electricity cupboards there by the mm -hmm. door. Uh, the brickwork itself is, you know, it's a lovely brick. So I should just say we managed, in spite of all that high quality, to deliver this for about eighteen hundred and twenty pounds a square meter, including yeah. all the landscape and roads. Um, so I want to stress that, you know, we're talking about quality and we're, we're we're getting granular here about, you know, materials, but we have managed to provide all this for a very affordable rate. Um, but Bernie, it did go kind of slightly over, over time and over budget. I mean, how does that compare to uh, the pound per square foot that's usually spent on social housing? So I'd say we're probably in this area at this kind of density, we're probably about five, our client believes it's about 5% more than they would have spent on a kind of bog standard RSL scheme. Okay. Uh, um, because it's done, you know, there are a hundred homes in the scheme. So the yeah. the costs of various things like the whole house ventilation system are aggregated around the whole, you know, there's, there's, there's volume, there's benefits of volume here. Mm. Uh, but I should also say, you know, we're in, we were able to embed quality because the client, uh, Norwich City and Andrew Turnbull, who was leading, um, had experience of design and build contracts, which are the kind of general way housing is procured. And they decided to have the faith in us to deliver this under a traditional contract. So that meant that we were able to ensure really high quality in delivery as well as in the detailed drawings and design so in other words the contractor was you know great but they 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 did require a lot of hand holding to actually deliver this quality with us mm -hmm. um, and that didn't come at a, you know much of a um a extra cost at all but mm -hmm. but long term i think the quality here is going to be really valuable for norwich yeah, and this is really valuable for the residents as well. I know it takes a bit of time to kick in, but once those energy costs actually start to come down, um, yeah. you know, it's going to make it. Yeah, I mean, it is. And, and I mean, a lot of people talk about this being done at scale in other different parts of the country, perhaps with um, less prosperous councils. Um, you know, there's got to be a trade off somewhere. Um, and obviously we want to build as much social and affordable housing as we possibly can. Um, and you were saying it about it being a good investment for Norwich. So I don't know if you wanted to kind of extrapolate on that a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, what they what they found as a local authority was that they're um, the, as members, as councillors, they were very persuaded by Passive House for all kinds of reasons. But one of the most compelling was that the feedback they were getting from the few Passive Houses they'd done and also Hasto, another local housing association had done, was that all the tenants were paying their rent, you know. Mm. Not only could tenants afford their fuel bills, but they were actually able to ensure that they were paying their rent. So um, the, 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 the numbers made sense to them in, yeah. their, in their accounting for extra costs. It made sense. And then there's all the other benefits which come from the long-term view of doing Passive House now which is that, you know, when we're targeting zero carbon 2050, um, you know, unless we're careful, we're going to have to be retrofitting a lot of the stuff we're building now. Yeah. So actually it's a false economy not to be doing passive house in our opinion and, and also in Norwich's opinion. Yeah. Um, and there's the added benefit of, you know, um, ensuring that the build quality is the same as the design quality. Now, I should stress that's hardly ever the case. So by going traditional contract route and going passive house, they were able to have a mechanism for ensuring that they got what they paid for. And that's going to mean long term, much less 
um, come back in terms of maintenance. And yeah, I was going to say the wear and tear is much less. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, the windows have got a 40 year life. Every, everything has been designed around a longer life. Mm. Um, and that's going to, I'm absolutely sure, pay dividends to Norwich in the future. Uh, so what, something else, these are the flats, aren't they, that we've got up at the moment? Yeah, so the flats were thought about as kind of big converted houses, if you like. You know, mm-hmm. like a, house, a three-storey house at the end of a terrace of two-storey houses. Um, what I really like about the, ter- the, the flats is everyone has, uh, there's a flat on each floor, one flat per floor. Every flat has its own front door at street level. So you see a pair of them there. The one on the right, 104, with a light blue door is the door to the ground floor flat, which is um, Lifetime Homes, M43. Uh, The one next to it is a door onto a lobby, which has its own, so the flat has it. As soon as you're through that threshold, that's your flat. And Mm -hmm. you've got your own staircase taking you up to your flat at first floor. And around the curved corner on Goldsmith Street itself, you'll just make out the brick portico to the third door, which takes you up to the second floor flat. Um, each flat has its own garden, the ground floor or a generous roof terrace facing south. Um, uh-huh. Each flat has its own entrance door at street, its own place for a bike or a pram at ground floor. And, you know, that real sense of um, as soon as you're past your front door, you know, there's no ambiguity about ownership. It's yours. Yeah. And this is it. So you've got rid of like the Edwardian sense of propriety that's outside. All the spaces outside seem designed for to chat to your neighbour, to be able to walk around to the shops and to be able to see the kids playing and to meet people. But then as soon as you get past your own front door, it's all about privacy. Yeah. And it's interesting. Annelie was looking back at where she grew up and her happiest times are in... Uh, uh, we both we're both children of suburbia, but her her happiest times were in a street. And she went back and looked at it recently, and guess what? It was Victorian, not Edwardian. It was forty meters between the street faces. Yeah, um, and there's just something really lovely about that kind of scale. Um, I mean, you know, obviously you're going to get some pushback. Some people want a drive with a car in it, um, mm-hmm. which is very very kind of um, ground hungry. You know, and it's very hard to make a nice place when you need a drive with a car. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the benefit here was that because we're 10 minutes away from the city centre, the client was able to relax car ownership expectations. They also did a survey of their likely tenants and found that, you know, 50 percent of them didn't have cars. Um, So we were able to do seven cars for every 10 homes. And they're all parking, they're all parking on street in, you know, parallel parking, traditional on street parking, the way that you get in the Golden Triangle. So nobody's got a designated parking space. And, and what that means is that, you know, that the public realm, the pavement, the front gardens, the bits of greenery outside people's front doors, they're all places where you can, you can, you know, bump into people and chat. Yeah. 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 And what does it do to the traffic when you narrow the roads? Does that have an effect on, the, you know, the, the cars that are, like, are able to go through there? And what kind of effect does that have? So the highway here is about 3.8 metres wide with two metre parking spaces either side. So the effect it has is to force people to go more slowly. So you'll see here there's a raised table across the junction. And, you know, there's a kind of 40 metre gap between this and the next raised table where people can pull in. So mm-hmm. people drive more slowly. You know, and again, that helps a sense of conviviality and safety for children. Um, I I have to say, I, I think it's really successful. And we were so lucky again here, not only with the brief asked for a, a kind of less car heavy scheme, which we were very lucky to, to receive, but also we worked with a great highways engineer in the local authority, Bruce Bentley, who was very receptive to a less conventional highways approach that is really unusual as well you know we've worked in lots of local authorities where the main battle isn't with the planners or the local authorities or or even the neighbors the main battle to do this kind of scheme is with the entrenched views of well-meaning highways authority um we've actually got a question on that if that's okay from david milner um 
So obviously as the project director for Create Streets, he said, did you have to challenge existing parking standards in the local council to get to 0.7 per household? Yeah, we thank you for the question. Um, we didn't have to challenge it as strongly as we do elsewhere because luckily Bruce, the head of highways, is very much on side in Norwich. Um, again, you know, one of those lovely coincidences that helped go into making a successful scheme. There are so many here. Um, but we are elsewhere, I have to say. It's, it's, it's like pulling teeth sometimes. Sure. Um, yeah, so if you want to go on to perhaps to what you're doing now, so in um, what you've carried over to what you're doing now in York, because, I mean, that's going to be zero carbon, right? Yeah, so York, before the Sterling, York had already commissioned us um, to deliver about 400 homes on five or six sites, which is really exciting. Um, and I just wanted, if I may, to show you a little snippet of where we are with that. We're just about to submit on to planning on three sites. Okay. Um, I'll just see if we can make the technology work for me. We've got Christian Evans here as an assistant planning officer and student who says that you'll have to make a crash course in challenging highways teams. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, <laughs> it's like a business side project going on. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, <laughs> OK, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? City of York? Yeah, yeah, I can see that one. Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, so York, you know, this is before the Sterling, which is, you know, very gratifying because it was a huge, again, it was a brilliant brief. So they put out an inv invitation to tender, but actually what really got us excited, so excited that we, we cut short our holiday and started writing answers to questions. I say we, Annalie did. Um, uh, and the, the questions that they posited were fantastic they were like how do you make you know if you were given the task of designing 400 homes how do you make them great communities how do you make them um places people would love to live you know th that may sound obvious but often we're answering questions on how we add value you know mm -hmm. how we meet a program um so they mark themselves out as a client that thought differently from the outset so we were absolutely thrilled to win this um, so they then put together a housing delivery program design manual for York. So this is a document which they see as not just informing their own delivery, but also the delivery of local developers and others as they come to work in York. Um, so I'm just going to trot through it because um, they're also, you know, they're not being too prescriptive, but they're showing what they think good might look like. So, you know, there's lots of work by Proctor and Matthews and, and others there. Mm. Um, Oh, sorry, just before you get into it, there's a quick question here from uh, Fabrizio Matalano who says, um, could Goldsmith have been delivered using MMC, so using modular housing, or is there a benefit in terms of quality to not pursuing that route? Oh, my God, that's such a big question. <laughs> um, and I know we're talking more about MMC tomorrow in the conference, but, yeah. So before I – yeah, I'll just answer that quickly um, – it, it was prefabricated to a very high degree. So it was prefabricated um, in a timber frame. Um, and that was a very important part of the process. So we persuaded our client to commission our subcontractor at the design stage. Um, they still had to go through due process and prove value, but um, they were not they were not guaranteed that that. Um, that they would deliver, but they, what that meant was that we were able to use a, an MMC. It wasn't fully vo volumetric. Um, in other words, things weren't delivered as big boxes. They were delivered as um, panels, which were then put together on site. Yeah. Um, is it possible to do that with Goldsmith Street? Yes, we believe so. We've done a study on how we would deliver it volumetrically, yes. It's actually very mod it lends itself very easily to a modular approach. So if there's anybody that wants to talk to me about that, be, I'd be happy to, um, to to set up a conversation there. In terms of costing, do you think it would have been a lot cheaper to go down the MMC route? We found whenever we look at MMC, it's not cheaper. It's no. allegedly quicker. But actually, when you you know go through the whole process of getting it signed off, it's very hard. Um, mm. Also, MMC tends to be... Um, valuable in terms of cost and time if there's a very clear product which is already tried and tested so it doesn't mm -hmm. tend to lend itself to um very 
site specific responses like this. OK, uh, so we've only got kind of five minutes left. Uh, so, yeah, if we could start to wrap this up. Somebody yeah. said, could that study delivering via volumetric volumetric be shared, please? Um, so, I mean. Uh, yeah, at some stage. Yeah. Yeah. Not now, I'm afraid. This um, <laughs> really well just to deal with this technology, frankly. But um, whoever that is, by all means, contact us. Um, yeah, I'll pass her on to you afterwards. Ellie George. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to show you very quickly some of the um, projects we're doing in York, which are, again, very site specific, but learning from Goldsmith Street. But I think the big difference that York are applying is taking the benefits of Goldsmith Street in terms of small children's play and placemaking and, and driving the sustainability agenda further. So we're looking here at zero carbon. And what that means in terms of design is really thinking, scratching our heads about south facing roofs and PVs. And you just get a sense of it here with this aerial view of Ordnance Lane. Mm. But, you know, but also at a slightly lower density, we're looking at much grander versions of the ginnels here um, and um, separation of, you know, windows that would comply with the nipple rule. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's a very complicated question that's just come through, but I'm going to do it anyway. How do we make this a very high standard of architectural and street design, the norm for all new housing projects? I mean, if there's one thing that you um, you know, could make um, compulsory within planning departments that you think would make this kind of high standard housing more prevalent, what would it be? Oh, my God. One thing. There is one thing. Um, I think. I mean, I feel we just need to get the message. One thing, one thing. I wish it were that easy. Um, I, I can't answer that. Yeah. There isn't one thing. Every project we and most good architects do is a combination of a million things that we're trying to to bring together. And, and planners, good planners too, know that there's a hundred things that you're thinking of simultaneously. Yeah. Um, I would drive the. I would the biggest. The biggest anxiety for us isn't what things look like. It's it's taking the car out of the equation. How how do we make yeah. things which aren't so reliant on the car to get your milk or to get you to school or to you know how do we take cars out? How do we yeah, make things more neighbors? I think that's more important than what it looks like. Um, yeah, my brother. My brother was run over at the age of six outside our house and I, he, he survived and everything's fine, but it was terrible. And I look back at that street many years later when we were doing the research on our own homes. I had the back alley at the back, but actually the road was 25 metres wide, you know, and that was 1969, 1970. And he was run over probably because somebody was encouraged to drive their car too fast. Um, yeah. So, you know, I just think, there's so much evidence that we've got to take the car out of the equation. That that and so highways are the big challenge for us. We need okay. to get them on side. We need to have won the argument with highways for them to be like Bruce Bentley was at Norwich and, and see themselves as creative people. Um I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap up. Uh, we've only got like a minute and a half left. But thank you so, so much for your time, David. It's been it's been fascinating. I'm sure it's been fascinating to everyone listening. I just want to say it's the end of day two of creating communities. Um, and tomorrow uh, we've got loads, loads more to come. So thank you to the day's partners, Savills and Barclay Group. Uh, if you missed a session today, you can go back. Um, just find the session you want to watch. Click playback and you can watch that there. Today's theme is placemaking. Tomorrow is planning and it starts at nine o'clock. Uh, we've got loads of stuff. A panel on planning for the future, Nicholas Boyd Smith. Uh, we've got long term investment in place and quality with we, uh, Labour's Shadow Housing Minister, Mike Amesbury. We've got another session on modular led by my colleague, uh, Martina Lees at The Times. Um, and a discussion with civic leaders in Barcelona, London, Bradford, Grimsby. Lots of great stuff tomorrow. So do log back in tomorrow. And thank you for being part of Creating Communities 2020. Oh, we still got 25 seconds. Great. Wow. I just absolutely zipped through that. But anyway, thank you so, so much, David. It's It's been fascinating. Right. Pleasure. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Great. And uh, yeah. And uh, again, you should uh, go back onto playback if you've missed anything from today. Um, yeah, the Secretary of State was on earlier making a great announcement about design coding. So definitely go back and have a look at that one, too. So anyway, bye, everyone.
Bye. Okay. You're still alive, Melissa. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, maybe not. David, if you would like to leave the session, there's a little uh, red door on the bottom left corner. And Where do I go now? <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.